Hello and welcome everyone. This is Adil Ali uh, from uh, Ikeamatic, a developer experience platform headquartered in New Zealand. I hope you have heard of the White Island Virtual Volcano News history. Yeah. So we do have a lot of volcanoes which are mostly passive, but some are active. So next time you fill it down, just ask me which one is where to go. So Ikeamatic is based in New Zealand, we do have offices in Pakistan, uh, where I main working from, and the United States. While I am in France today to talk about API adoption. Why API adoption? Interesting thing happened a few months ago. I was visiting a bank who had recently released a beautiful API portal which was PSG2 compliant and had all the bells and whistles. I asked them a question to the API team that how many developers are actually using that API portal? And the answer was an awkward silence. Because there were hardly any developers using that API, API uh, portal. I came for myself, but I could not make my first hello world, my first API call because of the security path I had to go through to make the first API call. And that made me realize why there are no developers using that. Why this is a problem? So if you are providing APIs, if you are API owner, and if you are worried about the ROI, return of investment, for your APIs, then you should be worried about API adoption. So let's begin by looking at the evolution of SaaS. We all know the SaaS evolved from web first to mobile first to API first and how it happened. 20 years ago, if you had a software product, you users used to access it using browser or a via web. Then with the, the advent of smartphones and high speed internet, we have the mobile first approach where the companies take care of the users accessing their platform via mobile. Fast forward to now. Now I access my email using a smartwatch. My car accesses real-time traffic data via internet. But we have not seen any, any smartwatch first or, or IoT first approach. Why? Because now we have this API first approach, which actually encapsulates everything from web to mobile to IoT. And even if you want your platform to be integrated with third-party applications, API is there to make that happen. So it's all about the API first approach, and that's why you know we are here at this conference. But with the APIs, this has become so important for like you know everything. This has become an interface to your product and everything related to outside world. The problem comes where this API, which is a language, a platform, independent medium of communication, try to access all those devices which are platform specific, which are language specific. And for that, to make this, this connection happen, we need a species called developers. Yeah. So developers are so important and they are the connection between our API and the outside world. So this is our like, bigger picture, how things are happening right now. And the focus, like we are doing API days, why? Because this API, as I mentioned, is, is the only interface from your organization to the outside world. Now we are, we have begun to see, we have begun to treat API as a product, where we take care of our users who are developers, we take care of API monitoring, we take care of API testing, rate limiting, and everything, API management. As well as, we should be taking care of the experience of the, these developers who are building beautiful applications you and we use. So, if APIs are being treated as a product, let's talk about product user experience. So Steve Brook wrote a brilliant book a few years ago where he presented a common sense approach to web and mobile usability, which was 
don't make me think while I am trying to achieve my goal of using your product. So if I do less steps, if I do it in, in least amount of time, then I am achieving my goal and I'm not thinking anything extra. So if product user experiences don't make me think, then the API developer experiences don't make me code. And the concept was not introduced by me. It was introduced by Steve Walsh from Opsi. And this resonates very well, that if a developer is trying to access an API, then we should be helping that developer by not letting him or her code anything extra. And now I smell small maps question. Anybody recognize this symbol? Exactly. Yeah. So directly proportional. So don't make me think is directly proportional to a good user experience. Similarly, don't make me code is proportional to a good developer experience, which is a key to the adoption of any product or any API. And how it can be achieved? By helping the user, by achieving the user goal in the least possible number of steps and in the least possible amount of time. Coming back to the API world, API adoption is directly proportional to developer experience and the goal of API DX is, again, least steps at time to reach the first hello world. So if you look at different talks and, and articles, you will find DX is, uh, like people define DX as the, the combination of the interaction between a developer and the API. So sum of interaction between a, uh, like a interaction with an API is for developer experience, I modified a bit because if a developer is able to reach the first hello world, if you can help him or her reaching this first hello world, then you are providing a good developer experience if you are able to do it in least step and time. So talking specifically about APIs to reach this goal, a developer typically needs to go through few steps. The first one is the getting started or reference API reference talks. Second one is sample application code about the configuration, about the parameters of an API call. The third bit is authentication code. We have different authentication schemes. And the final bit is API interaction code, making the call, serializing the, the response, request, etc. So if we elaborate this step, we can see more steps. So from getting started docs to configuration to API call arguments to authentication, and then a series of other steps, checks and validations, encoding of the input, fast forward to handling the errors before coming to the first hello world. So these are the steps a developer typically takes while achieving to this code, the first hello world. Once the developer reaches here, then the, you know the first integration is done, and it's only a matter of uh, you know more work from there. What good APIs do? It's an important thing. Good APIs segregate these steps into again four categories. The first one, the reference talk, the getting started is a static bit. The second one, uh, which was application uh, building, was is interactive. Authentication, again, with able interactive or assistive, while the communication with the API code is, again, static. And uh, again, good APIs do it by providing sections in their API box, such as getting started, building dynamic code samples, assistive authentication, and SDKs, which are, uh, also, which are also known as client libraries. So, I am quickly going to give an example of a good API, how we have implemented this uh, code playground, because everybody talks about Stripe, everybody talks about Twilio, you have seen plenty of time those examples, and, and believe me, you know, they are all similar. You know, if a developer, imagine the developer is in a code playground, and you're helping him or her by providing all these artifacts. So how they can be combined, so, Earthport is a, 
a fintech company based in the UK and recently acquired by Visa. So I have this example over here. So as I mentioned, the first step getting it started. So if a developer is coming to your API, you need to tell like how to get started with the sandbox, how to make requests, what are the errors, what are the data types, and anything which is specific to your API. So some text is always there. The second bit which I mentioned was the sample code, sample application. And that's where a lot of developers start. And if you can help a developer over there, believe me, you can increase the adoption of your API. And I'm going to show an endpoint over here. So this is the code to add a user, a create a user, a fintech user. So before this dynamic playground, code playground, what was there, a PDF document, I guess, which had all the text that if you want to use, uh, create a new user, you need to specify a concurrency, which is a mandatory one. User ID is optional. Again, pair identity is an optional, but if you want to have individual identity, you should select the pair identity first. So all of these things, imagine written in a PDF document instead of these check boxes. Now, coming down, address again is a, a, an option field, but over here, country. Valid, supported, ISO, blah, 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 which I don't know what it is, but if I try to use this G, it's telling me it should not be shorter than two characters. If I write Great Britain, again, it's giving me an error that it should not be more than two characters. If I come down, if I want to add an ID with my, uh, when I create an account, I can add this ID, I can add my passport or my ID card. If I want to add more IDs, I can do it, I can sort between among the IDs. So imagine all of this information, a developer is reading my box and have to remember, okay, I am adding pair identity. What kind of identity should I be having with that one? So understanding and keeping everything in mind is difficult. And if you are implementing some security protocols, so first understanding that, and then writing code of it, it is difficult. So look at Trilio, look at other API, look at this API. They are providing the code of everything. So whatever I have selected over here, I can see the code generated on the right of this. I can simply copy this, I can try it out to see if it works or not. The third bit, what was the third bit? Authentication. So again, what happens typically, we simply write in our guide that this is your OAuth server, take a token from there, bring it here, apply this, HMAC, blah, 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 and make authentication. That's it. We don't think of a developer who has you know, a, an IDE in front of him or her trying to integrate your API and you are not making his life or her life easier. What you can do, I have another good example of authentication here. So imagine you have like OAuth 2.0 and instead of asking a developer to go and bring in an like OAuth token and keep it refreshed after every 30 minutes, why can't you simply do it that for him or her? By simply taking client ID and client secret and specifying all over here. And once you are done, this information will go to your core sample and you are helping developer by reducing a few steps for him or her. Coming back, the fourth bit, which is SDKs. And SDKs, like I have talked in multiple conferences about SDKs, you can check those. I'm not going to talk about the importance because the next presentation is about SDKs and the importance of those. SDK is something which takes care of all the communication between your application and the API. And it saves a huge amount of time because a developer doesn't have to think about like how to deal with uh, creating an HTTP request, which library should I be using, how to serialize the request, how to re-serialize the response, how to parse the objects and everything. And what you can do, you can simply provide everything by providing a bundle, get SDK, and you can download it. I'm not talking about like, you know, uh, what could 
like this is not the topic of this talk that how dynamic and how many things can be added and what are the differences between an SDK and an API wrapper. What I'm going to talk about is this. Your sample code should be referencing the SDKs or if you are providing SDKs and if you are not providing sample code of that SDKs, you are getting it at the time of development. And how easy is this? Let's go for example, show complete file now. So this SDK which is, uh, I believe, a jar file in Java, so import all the references, everything is added over here. So what a developer can do, all the four things are done, if I, I have not added any auth information, but if I click try it out, I have my own input, I have my everything, and now this is trying to call the API in live. And uh, of course, I did not add any information, but if I added, so I had reached my first hello world with my own input. So that's kind of experience. And I asked the question, one of my team members asked the question with Earthport that how good has been the user experience? And the answer was, Amazing, overall. Uh, and you, go well, he said that it's not just a cost saver, but in fact a revenue generator for us because of faster integration and, and better developer adoption. <coughs> now, coming towards the conclusions, <coughs> if you are providing API as a product, so your developers should be using your API like they use any other product. They, they should be having all kind of you know good experiences with that product. For the best developer experience, don't make them code anything extra, anything more than they, they, they are supposed to do. And the third thing, give them what they need to get started. Let them focus on what they are building. Okay. It's important that you know your audience and you speak their language. If you don't speak a language, you are missing the whole community of developers, which can be captured by your competitors. And I want to conclude my talk by, by quoting uh, Nelson Mandela, that how important is the concept of speaking the language? If you talk to a man in the language he understands, that goes to his head. But if you talk to him in his own language, then it goes to his mind. Developers are more different, know them, speak their language. Thank you.